Welcome to another episode of the Data Science Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Dave Cole, and today's guest is a friend of the podcast, Nancy Hirsch. Nancy, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me, Dave. Good to be here. Great. Um, so Nancy is the Chief Data Officer at Arcadia. Uh, Nancy has 20 plus years experience in data science and analytics, uh, including uh, in the consulting and energy sector. Um, and there's three things that we're going to be tackling today, and maybe more. Uh, we're going to be talking about the art of uh, sort of the data science project. So understanding, in your words, the data analytics value chain. So if you're wondering what on earth that means, Nancy's going to tell us in a bit. Um, we're also going to talk a bit about sort of like uh, an apprenticeship model uh, for getting data scientists a little bit closer to the business. Um, and then the third thing we're going to tackle is um, I think Nancy has a unique sort of uh, a way of hiring data scientists. So um, that I really thought was would, would be interesting for you all to, to, to hear. Um, but before we dive into our topics, I did want to talk a, a little bit about Arcadia, because uh, I think it's a very interesting company uh, where you work, Nancy. Um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, it makes me in this bleak, uh, crazy world that we live in today uh, with well, COVID and everything bleak. else. Don't <laughs> Sorry. be bleak. You're giving us. me. Yes, the, you're the 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 rail light or the the light at the end of the tunnel um in the, in the distance so t talk to me a little bit about what arcadia does today awesome um will do so arcadia is a climate tech company um and our business really does two things number one we connect people and businesses with something called community solar most people don't even know community solar exists but it's basically the idea that that homes and businesses can access solar that's not in their roof um, and they do it virtually. So we help to, to connect the supply, that community mm -hmm. solar with demand, residences and businesses. Um, and what my team does is helps really to bring analytics to that equation so that we can be as smart as possible in the way that we connect that demand and supply. Got it. The second so, thing we do, oh, sorry, okay. go ahead. So I was gonna say, so, the, so if I am a, a business, right? Yeah. And I you know, want a larger percentage than I have today, of my uh, electricity coming from solar power, um, you will help connect me to a supplier, essentially that, that, that you know that, that will give me sort of solar power and cleaner energy. Is that yep, about right? To a community solar farm that's providing it. And what's kind of cool about this is it's true for businesses, but it's even more powerful for residential uh, folks because typically solar is really only accessible to a small portion of the population. You have to own your house, it has to have the right orientation, you have to be reasonably right. wealthy to afford it. Um, but for community solar, none of that's true. You can live in an apartment, um, you can be low middle income. Um, all you have to do is want to access renewable energy. And believe it or not, it's cheaper. It's cheaper than the energy you get from your utility. Really? So, yeah, so, so this is awesome because- secret, Hidden secret, community solar. Yes, <laughs> I, I had no idea that community solar existed um, this is awesome because I have this beautiful and amazing live oak tree in my front yard in my home, but sadly it creates this massive amount of shade that keeps my house cool, but prevents me from putting a solar panel on my roof. And I've had two companies come out here and they both yeah. like, I try my best to put solar panels on the roof. I'm trying to do the right thing um, and, and failed both times. So this sounds like a good sort of workaround, if you will, uh, tapping into to a community solar uh, farm. That's awesome. Exactly. Um, cool. You were going to say something else. Sorry, I cut you yeah, off. No, I was just going to follow that. We have a second line of business as well, which is a data platform. Um, this will be of particular interest to all of the data scientists out there. Um, we take all of the information that we are that we utilize for our community solar product, and we take it and open it up so that other companies can access it as well. So we have a data platform full of energy information as well as the ability to um, build customers. And we're now uh, providing access to that information to all sorts of companies, companies that provide rooftop solar, companies that are doing you know, home automation um, so that they can use that to innovate within their own businesses. Awesome, that makes, uh, yeah. I mean, I think like sort of democratizing data and allowing other you know, uh, companies to sort of benefit from that with the the end goal here, you know, just sort of getting ourselves uh, off of fossil fuel um, is again what I was saying at the outset is is just fantastic. Um, That's it. It's been a closed yeah. system for far too long, and we're busting that wide open. 
Yeah, I was watching. I, you know, there's there's this quote from Elon Musk. Um, he was at was he was actually at like a a, a conference, uh, an energy conference, uh, surrounded by sort of your fossil fuel executives. Um, and they were asking about you know the future of of cars and electric cars, and, and he said, "Look, it's it's really simple. Um, there's a finite amount of fossil fuels out there. Like eventually, all cars, all vehicles are going to have to transition to something that is not dependent upon fossil fuels." That's the way I look at it. Like, like this is a dying business. <laughs> like, whether you like, like, it's just a known fact. It's not even a question. Uh, so, um, you know, the fact that you know you all are, are taking you know the vanguard and helping to make you know that transition a little bit quicker uh, again is is just awesome to hear. Well, it's, all right. Get up in the morning and do it every day. I'll tell you uh, that. Yeah, that would get me going for sure. Uh, let's get going. Let's talk about the art of the data science project. So, you know, you, we talked like in prep for this call about the data analytics value chain. Um, what are some of the approaches to sort of data science projects? Um, what is it your sort of methodology that you think um, would, would help our audience? All right, Dave, I'm going to draw it in the air because this is just the way I work. I have to draw in the air. So follow me. Here we go. All right. So we're going to go left to right. Um, and I think about literally every single data science project, every single analytics inquiry as having five elements. And this is what I call the data science and analytics value chain. So. First, you have to understand the problem. You really need to get deep into the underpinnings of the actual problem you're solving. Number two, data. Sounds simple, right? Actually really complex, but after you understand the problem, you need to go get the data you're going to need in order to solve it. Step three, quant. You're gonna use some sort of analytic technique, some sort of quantitative approach, can be super simple or super complex, mm -hmm. on that data in order to understand the problem. Fourth step is interpret. Okay, great, you've done some math. Well, interpret it. Tell me, what did you find? What did you learn? What's new? And then the last stage is output. Okay, so now you've done all this work, what are you creating out of it? This could be a piece of code. Um, this could be a data visualization from a BI tool. This could be a PowerPoint presentation that you know creates customer segments that other groups act upon. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different forms, but you really need to get that whole totality of the value chain in order to create value out of data and analytics. That's my belief. Got it. Okay. So we got a five step process just to recap, uh, step one, understand the problem. Step two, um, you know, what data is required, I think to solve that problem. Uh, and do you have that data? Does it exist? Um, and the, the third step is the quantitative step, um, you know, what analytic, you know, sort of approach are you going to take? You know, what type of model are you going to build? Yep. Um, and the next, and then the fourth step is sort of interpreting the results, right? Yep. So, um, and, or, you know, what have you learned from the model that you've built? Um, and the last one, at least, is sort of that, that output. So what is, what is it going to be the interface, essentially, between you know, everything that you've learned and the model that you've built with the actual end user? Uh, yeah. is, is that right? How does it get put to, put to use, right? Okay. And, and like I said, sometimes that's for people and sometimes it's for machines, right? right? So the ML AI manifestation of output is gonna be very different from you know a basic analytic approach, but you still need to have something that gets utilized. Great, uh, next topic, just kidding. Um, so we're gonna dive into uh, some of these steps here. So the first one is, um, is understanding the problem. So, so well, for, I guess, first of all, like who's doing all of these steps? Like, is it a, is it the data scientist um, uh, herself who's, who's sort of shepherding through the, this entire process? Like how, how, how does this usually manifest in, sort of in the real world? Yeah, so I like to organize teams in the following way. I find that it's really a lot more effective if you can get single people who essentially run up and down that value chain. Um, some companies organize more vertically. So they have one person who understands the problem and they bring in a different person who gets the data and then they bring in a different person still who's doing all the math. Um, but I find there's just lots and lots of loss in that system. Right. And, you know, as, you know, data scientists who are operating, you know, within this framework, you're making micro decisions all the time. You know, which data field should I pull? Is it X or Y? You know, which um, decision should I make on my technique? Should I use A or B? And you really need to have the context for the entire problem and the entire system in order to make those decisions correctly. Um, so I like it when um, I, I and I try to develop teams 
where people are essentially doing all of this, mm -hmm. where they're working really closely with stakeholders to understand the problem. They're clearly very self-sufficient on data and on the quantitative side, but then they're also circling back with those stakeholders um, with their learnings and findings. Um, and so it becomes a cycle. Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's kind of a couple of different approaches in doing data. I mean, obviously it's more than that, but like there's what I've largely seen on the podcast is that um, there's that more of a, an artisanal approach um, like what you described where a single data scientist can sort of uh, do it all um, yep. and is encouraged, uh, you know, to, to work very closely with business users, uh, even, you know, do the data munging and data wrangling um, all the way to building the model and then even, you know, productionalizing, helping to productionize that model. And then you have more of sort of a, a factory model where, you know, each step of the way um, there might be a dip, you know, in this, uh, uh, data analytics value chain, uh, where you might have a different uh, individual or different team um, that is owning that step. But to your point, like anytime you introduce different people, you have, uh, you know, opportunities for there to be loss in understanding. Um, and it can, you know, even though it's designed to speed things up, when you lose that understanding, um, it, you know, you, you can have, it can lengthen, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the overall project, right? Yeah, I think, I think quality suffers too, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, at least what I see um, across companies, um, folks tend to think that what's going to be really hard about data science is the middle of the chain, the you know data munging, and then you know using sophisticated quantitative techniques. But at the end of the day, that doesn't end up being the stuff that's the hardest. Um, the data component, in particular, may take the longest, but the stuff that ends up being the the hardest to get right are the ends of the chain. It's understanding the problem and creating the output that actually gets used. Um, and so I think if you split it up into these pieces, you just end up with product that often you know, resides on the cutting room floor and doesn't actually get utilized because you're not solving the fundamental business problem because that gets lost in the shuffle. Great. Uh, yeah, to totally agree. Um, so is there any, in your experience in, in implementing this in projects, like have there been challenges with this approach, like ha having in this case, a, a single sort of data scientist um, sort of sort of do it all? I mean, I, I clearly understand the benefits, like basically what you described, but are there any sort of gotchas um, with this approach? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this is really hard, right? Um, the ability to do all of these different components, you know, to varying levels of perfection is just, it is tough. It's yeah. really hard to find people who are both you know, eager to get mucky in the data and then do the quant and also are, you know, communicators and business people who are, you know, eager and able to both understand the business context and also, you know, communicate and create good output. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what I tend to find is that when people are junior, they tend to start in the middle. So they sort of major either on the data side or on the quant side. And then over time, what I try to do um, as a team leader and what I try to inculcate with my managers is staff development so that those folks, as they become more senior, they become more and more facile on the ends of the chain. They become better at understanding the business context. They're better at doing problem decomposition. They're better at being sort of a partner to the business and really understanding what problems matter most. Similarly, on the other end, you know, creating output, if it's you know, scalable productionalized code, they're you know, getting better as they're developing their engineering chops. If it's creating a presentation for marketing, they're becoming a better analytic you know, narrative creator over time. But you know, it really is, it's an apprenticeship model where you work with others to see how it's done and then you develop the skills yourself, then you put them to use and over time you might be managing people and teaching the craft to the next person. Right. All right, well, um, this makes a lot of sense. I think it's it's, you know, it, it's not too dissimilar um, at a high level um, from what I've seen in a lot of regards. I, I think it's, uh, you know, very crisp and, and very clean. Um, when you're working with like sort of the, the you know, the, your, your business counterparts, um, are they involved, are they only involved in sort of that first and last step or do you involve them um, in, in any, of the, any of the other steps as, as well? Um, some, but much less. Like there's no doubt that the first step and the last step are where, you know, you are tight at the hip with your business partner, right. um, where you're working with them to make sure they really understand the problems they have. Cause you know, I bet this may resonate with some of your listeners. Often you'll work with a stakeholder and they say, you know, I have problem X 
But then you poke on it and you figure out it's not really X. It's like X prime or X double prime, right? <laughs> so you have to be like really tight at the hip with them so that you can work with them to refine exactly what their problem is. Um, and clearly same on the output side. We need to have output that they're gonna use, output they're gonna understand, and so that's very iterative. In the middle of the chain, sometimes I find that there are, that are check-ins. So it's more about making sure that we, you know, really have internalized the problem correctly mm -hmm. and that it's manifesting in the data that we're pulling and the quant that we're doing. Um, but that tends to be much more, you know, our job with just a, a light touch with the stakeholders. Got it. Um, the, you know, I think this is a good segue to talk a little bit about the apprenticeship model, because one yeah. of the things that um, on the, you know, when you're talking about getting closer to the business and making sure that. Um, you know, you truly understand their problem. Um, you, you can go at it like you could be if, if you're just coming straight out of school and haven't had a lot of experience, like you might be great at asking, you know, the question behind the question and, and really digging. Um, but usually that I, my, my experience, it, it, it comes from working in the real world. It comes from, um, yeah. you know, working with your, your business constituents on a regular basis and really truly understanding um, the world from their point of view. Uh, I think that's Oftentimes, you know, where 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 data scientists sort of um, just gloss over, right? Um, like understanding what your business partner's strategic objectives are, what they're gold on, um, yep. and they focus on the problem, right? So, so talk to me a little bit about like how you know what what this apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship model is. Yeah, well, I think you know, as I mentioned, and I think we'll talk about, talk about hiring in a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to hire people who are good in the middle, but I think have potential on the ends. And a lot of the potential on the ends, you know, before you've gone through your, you know, quote unquote apprenticeship is it's about being curious. It's about being an innate sort of problem decomposer, you know, how, looking for the ability to take an unstructured, big, wide open situation and cut it up into logical parts. Right. And that's something that you don't need to have experience in the business world to do. That's something that you can, you know, do straight out of school. Now, what you do need to do in the business world is figure out how you take that, you know, core um, ability set and translate it into a particular company. So, you know, understanding the business context is something you need to learn. Understanding how you can take those problem decomposition skills and apply them to, you know, a given domain, whether it's, you know, marketing or understanding a product. Um, and that's what I think you learn via the, you know, apprenticeship by watching other people do it and then slowly doing it more and more yourself. So you're talking about um, like like a, maybe a junior data scientist w being an apprentice to a more senior data scientist, but yeah. are you do you also um, apply that same sort of apprenticeship model uh, to embedding like do you believe in sort of embedding some of your data scientists into the various lines of business? So like let's say your marketing team yep. um, needed you know had a bunch of you know marketing related use cases and y you realize that a vast swath of your team maybe didn't really understand. And would you advocate embedding um, you know, members into the team in, in some way, into that marketing team in some way? Right. The org structure question. What org yeah. structure goes along with this whole concept? Yeah, it's, it's important. So I like to create um, data science teams that are centralized but are mapped to different functions, right? So at the end of the day, you know, if you believe in this value chain, you're not going to be able to understand every single problem that the company has. That's just too much for one person to do. But what is tenable to do is to take one person and to have them aligned with a given function. Um, and as your team gets bigger and bigger, a different, a sub function within that function. Um, so I like to have people at a minimum aligned to one function and ideally aligned to a component of work within a function. So you'd never have a data scientist who works on both say marketing problems and product problems. That's just mm -hmm. too much terrain to cover. <laughs> You want to have people who are mapped to their specific constituencies. So, you know, ones that typically exist in tech companies are, you know, maps to product, maps to marketing, um, sometimes mapped to finance, but finance is sort of a, you know, beast in and of itself often, mm -hmm. um, sometimes mapped to sales. So right. having these functional mappings, there's a very clear stakeholder that you're working with. Right. And then and when you're sort of mapped to these various functions, obviously, that's where you get the sort of the domain expertise exactly. and you, you, you build up the, that expertise, um, you know, turns into being able to handle the, the, the two ends of the, you know, the, the, the life cycle, um, that makes exactly. you know, the value exactly. chain. So that makes a lot of sense. 
Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, you know, building up a team from scratch in a small tech company, which, you know, a, t a typical sort of software org structure, you might have a data scientist who's focused on all of product. And then as the team grows, you know, they would end up being, you'd have, you know, three or four data scientists, each of which are focused on a different part of the product. Right. 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 Um, and then as everything grows, then you might have multiple data scientists on a given part of the product. Um, but so this whole structure is really extensible um, and can grow as companies grow. Um, and I like it because I think, you know, it breeds quality and efficiency. Right. I mean, that, that seems to be a theme, right? Is that like that tight coupling between um, in making sure there's no information loss. Like that, that, that's what I'm hearing from you. Like, you, and you can do that in a couple of ways. One is, is you, you know, you have um, one individual sort of own that end to end, uh, you know, analytics product that you're, you're, you're building. Um, yeah. And the second thing is by, you know, taking an approach where you actually uh, align members of your data science team to the various, uh, you know, departments within the, you know, the, the constituents that make up your sort of your, your business uh, community, business users, business yeah, stakeholders. Bingo. You yeah. got it. Okay, cool. I'm learning. Um, I'm that that's makes total sense. I'm learning a lot. Um, let's talk about how you hire, uh, you know, data scientists um, that can, that can then go into this, this, uh, into this great team of yours. Um, so right. how do you go about hiring uh, uh, this this crack team? Hiring the million dollar question. It's so hard, right? It, it, right now it is it is un, incredibly hard, right? The, yeah. It is absolutely a candidate's market. Yep, it, it is. Um, you know, but I think, you know, what's what's really important with hiring, there's a, there's a sort of standard set of activities that, you know, tend to exist in tech data science hiring. And I think they, they make sense. You know, they include stuff like, you know, you do some homework before you engage in an interview process. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the sort of homework tends to focus again on the middle of the value chain. You're going to see I use this value chain constantly. Yeah. <laughs> I use it like every day in the way I work. I use it in the way I think about hiring, career development, the whole nine yards. Anyway, you'll be sick of it by the end of the episode. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, in, you can use homework to get a beat on data and quant. Um, and then as you, you know, move through an interview process, you know, behavior-based interviewing is a, is a really good way to approach um, these sort of problems. The thing that I like to do that's a little bit different from most is I, very, per, quite early in interview processes, I have the candidate come in and do a presentation on an analytic topic of their choice. Mm -hmm. And they do it to the group. They do it to the upcoming interview slate. And I like to provide a pretty open-ended prompt like that so mm -hmm. that, you know, we can see what the candidate does with their half an hour where they're going to, you know, go through an analytic topic of their choice and do some Q&A with us. And you really get a huge gamut of different um, items that come to the table. You know, sometimes you'll have someone who says, here is my PhD thesis. And then boom, you know, slide <laughs> yeah. two is you know, equations galore and a super deep dive into something. Um, and what I'm really looking for in that, you know, presentation moment is does the candidate essentially kind of go through the value chain, right? Mm -hmm. Do they tell you, here's what I'm trying to solve. Here's how I solved it. Here's what I learned and here's the value it created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, if that's, if that's the way they approach this problem, they're going to naturally lean into and gain competencies in working this way. Um, so I find you just learn a lot from doing that upfront. Okay. And, you know, I've seen, I've been at some companies where sometimes they do this for data science, but if they do it at the end, and most companies don't do it at all because they're focused on the tech side. Yeah. Um, and I, I really do think it's this, you know, double-edged sword where it's important to have all of the technical skills for sure but just sort of understanding people's problem solving orientation is just as important. So a, a great way to bomb your, uh, it sounds like your that presentation with your team is if like slide one, you dive straight into, um, like check out this cool computer vision model that I built, um, yeah. you know, to, to, well, to identify cats. You know, Dave, why'd you build it? What right, you why? Doing? What's all, you know, you what to business achieve. problem are you solving? Like why, you, you know, the why behind it, um, and, you know, not talking about the data um, that you use, you know, to train the model, um, what challenges potentially do you have with the data? Like, tell me a little bit about the data itself. Um, then you can dive in and say like, you know, the, the how, but I think also yeah. too, like, 
you know, you start with a business problem and maybe you tease, like if I'm presenting, I would start with a business problem and then I would maybe tease, like what you really want to have is this, like, like something that would, would drive this, right? And sort of tease the end goal. And yep. then you talk about the how on, on how yeah. you actually, you know, built, it could be a dashboard or it could be, you know, a, a real a model that's, that's uh, you know, providing uh, product recommendations in real time or whatever, yep. right? Yep. Um, cool. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I would also, uh, again, poking on this a little bit, Nancy, but I would, do you run the risk, right, of some candidates coming in um, with potentially like really easy sort of, you know, problems that, that have been solved many times before? Um, uh, or, or, and then you, know, you have a PhD candidate coming in and, and talking about a very, very difficult problem. So it sounds to me like that, that's less, you, you care more about like that process, right? Um, yeah. And how they explain it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some of the best presentations that I've seen are from the people who have the most technical chops. They're mm -hmm. just not, you know, that's not what's on display. They're demonstrating their technical chops when they, you know, talk about some of the approaches and methods they took, but really quite lightly and often, quite frankly, visually, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. With like, and, you know, here's the killer output that led me to the conclusion I came to, or that mm -hmm. is really at the heart of the algorithm I built. Um, and so, you know, I think if you've got folks out there listening that are about to interview for data science positions, I think all sorts of data scientists really focus on the how, when yeah. how's important, but it's really important to accompany it with why and what, yeah. and people just lose track of why and what. So you can have the best, most fantastic how in the world. And if you simplify it and wrap it up in the how and what, that's when it comes to life. That's when it really sings. Yeah. I, I have found myself, I mean, I, I know you've probably interviewed, you know, hundreds of candidates and uh, the number of times I've had to stop someone and just say, hold on, can you just explain to me like what problem you're solving first? <laughs> yeah. exactly. And and because that grounds it, like you're not understanding why, you know, um, they went in a certain direction and why they pulled in certain, you know, uh, you know data uh, that they needed. Like they're so, you know, they, and, and I get it, like we're data scientists, like I think sometimes what interests us in, in solving these problems is the how, right? Is the, um, you know, this new algorithm that we tried out for the very first time and, oh my gosh, it, it, you know, the accuracy was way better than the, you know, the, the model that we built before and I knocked everybody's yep. socks off and they were super impressed. Yep. But, you know, if you don't ground it in, in reality and, and, and why it's important, um, uh, you're going to lose, you're, A, you're going to lose the listener and, and B, you're probably going to sh show that like, um, you you run the risk of being that mad scientist, right? Which everyone loves, um, but doesn't really drive tons of value all the time. Like sometimes they come up with like really cool things by happenstance, uh, but they're not always driving consistent value. Uh, yeah. That's at least my perspective. I, no, I, I, I agree, and I you know I'm, I'm all for a mad scientist too. But you know, in that situation, fantastic, you found you know a. Uh, you know, uh, your challenger beat the champion and it did it with yeah. this really cool way. Awesome. So then what happened with it? How did you use your challenger model in a way that was more effective than the prior champion and how much value did it create? Right. That's the bow on it. Right. 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 And sometimes, you know, you hear, oh, the, the, the challenger beat the champion, but I had to, you know, spin up a massive GPU farm, uh, you know, that cost us, you know, hundred grand to train the right. model or something like that. And you're like, wow, you know, where's that? There's, where's the practical? Yes. You know, the accuracy is 2% higher than it was before, but like, you got to think practically, um, as well. Uh, so, so cool. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I wanted to also just, um, throw out here, you know, one last sort of question, like, yeah. um, what's sort of top of mind for you? Like, um, uh, I'm curious, you know, what in, in the world of data that we're in, like, is there anything that um, in current events or, or other things that has sort of piqued your interest or in, that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, you know, it's funny over over the holidays, you know, we've had a, a sort of snowy little bit here in D.C. and there's been lots of time to take walks over the break. Um, and the thing that's been really on my mind recently is Elizabeth Holmes and the Theranos trial. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's this like untold data story that accompanies it, right? That like data should have been at the center of this whole thing and people just overlooked it, mm -hmm. right? Like at the end of the day, the blood testing equipment that she developed just didn't work very well. Um, and she was overlooking it 
maybe intentionally because the right. data was bad. Investors yeah. overlooked it. Um, the whistleblowers were the people who paid attention to it um, and were, you know, highlighting the fact that, you know, the data was telling everyone that stuff wasn't working yet. Um, and I think, you know, in general, if you know, many parties in this uh, system had been more attuned to the data, a whole lot of this pain would have been avoided. Um, and I think, you know, from our perspective as data scientists, you know, we're in a really, really cool spot because, you know, it's our job to go tell the truth. Right. You know, that's what we do. You know, we're so lucky. You know, we are sort of the arbiters of, of truth and our jobs to tell it like it is um, and to accompany that perspective with how things can get improved and get better. But, you know, man, I really feel like a lot of Theranos might not have happened if folks were able to just pay a little bit more attention and be more attuned to what the data around them was telling them. Yeah, I I think too often, um, now I'm gonna get on, on my soapbox again here, but I, I think too often um, data scientists are put in a position of sort of being like order takers, right? So you have the marketing team comes to you and says like, hey, um, we're, we're planning on running a hundred campaigns this year and we want uh, you to stand up a, a way to measure this, you know, our, our campaigns, right? Um, here you go, um, here's here's our requirements. Um, we'll work together and we'll, we'll, we'll solve it. but. Um, more often, I'd like to see, you know, data scientists get involved more in the strategy, right? So you could imagine with in the Theranos, in the, you know, rolling back the clocks, if Elizabeth Holmes had sat down, uh, you know, with the data science team and said, like, hey, um, and maybe this did happen. Was, <laughs> she just ignored it, like, to your point, but right. like, hey, what is the data telling us? Like, uh, what what should we be doing? Like, where where are some of the, you know, the issues, um, you know, in this, uh, in this, this product that we're, we're, we're building? Um, and seeing them more as sort of a strategic partner and let, you know, and I don't know how, you know, whether it even was a data science team at Theranos or where they were asked upon. So I think it's kind of the first thing that you're saying. The second thing you're highlighting too, which is as investors, um, you know, you, you have to be asking these questions. You have to be asking, not to see the raw data perhaps, but um, you have to be asking, you know, quantitative type questions and looking at, um, you know, the, the, the data in, in this case, you know, looking at the, the accuracy um, and so on. So yeah. I, I think that makes perfect sense to me. Absolutely. You know, just basic questions about how does a product operate? Doesn't matter whether it's a blood analyzer or a software product, you know, just asking and being able to frame the basic answers around that. How mm -hmm. is this thing working? What result is it creating? Um, that has to be, you know, top of mind for everybody. Yeah. And you probably, you know, if, if if what we're you know implying is that, that maybe they were asking those questions, it's just they were getting uh, fall, uh, false answers. Um, yeah. You know, I think it, it it behooves you sometimes, you know, to actually bring in you know your 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 head of data science and ask you know like hey like I'd, I'd like to see the data. I have some more additional questions. Can you and just you know drill in a little bit and and so I you know. I'm, it's it's rare, if ever, you know, in my experience that you've seen like a head of data science in the boardroom. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe the Theranos trial, you know, changes that. Who knows? That'd be pretty cool. That would be cool. Um, well, we'll leave it there. Um, so, Nancy, you know, if people want to get in touch with you and, and follow up with on anything that we discussed today, you know, can they hit you up on LinkedIn? Yeah, for sure. Um, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out. Um, you know, I'm, as mentioned, I'm the chief data officer at Arcadia. You can find me there too. Um, but, you know, we're hiring and <laughs> doing real cool stuff for the world. So awesome. um, I, I've had a great time. It's been really fun to connect, Dave. This is great. Uh, thanks for being on the Data Science Leaders Podcast, Nancy, uh, and have a great rest of your week. Great. Sounds good. Thanks a bunch.